This is WCN. The Whole Care Network. You talk. We listen. Content presented on the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent views of the Whole Care Network. Always consult your physician for medical and fitness advice and always consult your attorney for legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Welcome to Island Treasures, a place for caregivers to hear encouragement from other caregivers who, by sharing their experiences, offer helpful information and resources for your caregiving journey. This podcast is brought to you by Alongside Caregiver Consulting, and I am your host, Alison Van Shee from beautiful Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada. Today's guest is the founder of the Dementia and Alzheimer's Wellbeing Network and the creator of the Dawn Method, which is a strength-based approach to dementia care. You will hear how Judy started caring for her neighbor who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and that introduced Judy to the world of caregiving and dementia. Judy was able to draw from her background in linguistics and law to see that when things don't make sense, it means we don't have enough facts. She takes us on a journey exploring intuitive or experiential thinking skills and rational thinking skills, and how by working with the skills our care recipients still have, rather than against them, we provide this kind, person-centered approach to dementia care. Join me now as I welcome Judy Cornish. Welcome, Judy. Oh, thank you so much, Allison. I've been really looking forward to getting to chat with you again. Me as well. Uh, When I first heard about you, I was so excited because strength-based dementia care, that was my wheelhouse as a former social worker. I just love the strength-based approach to everything. So that just really resonated with me. You know, and it's funny because I don't have any background in medicine or social work or psychology or anything like that. And it came to me organically, not through any exposure to fields of study. Well, it just shows an intuition that you have, and that just feeds right into what Dawn Method is about. (laughs) Yeah, and the one thing I always say about strength-based care and habilitative care and being person-centered, there's people just like me doing and recognizing person-centered care all over the world. And when people reinvent the wheel, it's because we need wheels. And for me to come to the realization that what I was doing is recognizing the strengths that exist in dementia, to me, that's proof. There are strengths. It's there, even even for a lawyer to see. (laughs) (laughs) So, yes, that's another side of you. (laughs) (laughs) A small part. So, Judy, would you tell the listeners how you got into doing what you do? Yes, I should, because it's different. And, you know, I'm not medical, but most of us get involved with dementia care because we have a family member, a loved one who begins to experience it. So most of us, uh, we don't get to choose. And many of us actually have to walk away from our careers, you know, what we're really good at, what we have decades of experience in. And we are torn away from that because we love somebody who begins to experience dementia. But for me, it was different. I had left Portland, Oregon, where I was practicing law quite miserably. Mm. (laughs) And I was looking for a small town near mountains. And I pictured myself, you know, I was in my 50s. And I thought, boy, you know, my children are gone from the home. I can do what feels good to me. I know what I would like to do. I'd like to garden and ski in the wintertime and practice elder law. And so it took me some time to get relocated and to find Moscow, Idaho. But immediately within, you know, days of getting settled, there was a woman across the street and um, she'd be out watering her tomato plants and her beans. You know, she had curly white hair and a big smile and first we'd wave and then I went over and, you know, and, and pretty soon she says to me, you know, I've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. There's only one thing I'm good at anymore. 
And she says, I'm really good at forgetting. Oh. But as I got to know her, you know, she, she had this intricate, beautiful system of sticky notes. Mm -hmm. She was coping and she was doing it with incredible intelligence and courage. And then her daughter came to town, came over and said to me, well, you know, mom, she's even more forgetful. She keeps losing the car. We're going to sell the house and put her over there in that care facility. And so I said, oh, please don't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, if she needs to buy, go buy groceries, I can take her. She wants to go swimming in the morning. I'll take her. I'm an early riser. I can read a book, um, answer email. And that began. And within two weeks, the phone would ring and the person would say, I hear you're looking after so-and-so's <laughs> mom. My dad lives there. He's a little forgetful or he's been diagnosed with dementia. And so I think within two weeks, I had six. Wow, the floodgates opened. Living alone, beginning to experience dementia. And the family calling me and saying, can you help us? Within two months, I realized I'd started a business. Now that was 2010. And that was before dementia care was even a search term. It oh, really? wasn't, it wasn't even a search term. And, you know, and me knowing nothing about computers or business or how to start a business, how to run a business, how to employ, be an employer. I didn't know any of that. I just knew that I was going to keep these people safe to live at home and take part in the community and do what they liked to do. And I, I began with, um, I think by, before the, that was September, by the end of the year, I think I had two employees, maybe somewhere between half a dozen, six to 10 people that we were looking after. Oh. But here's what happened. And so this is what's different about what my exposure to dementia. I have no medical background. That's the same as most of us as caregivers. Most of us are not social workers. We don't have degrees in social work. We don't understand psychology. We have never studied neurology. We are just normal people trying to look after our loved ones, trying to do a good job. And that's who I was, except I was trained. My undergraduate work is in language, uh, literature, art, music, language acquisition, how people learn languages. My graduate work, of course, is law. And, and so with that background, when I began to spend time with people who were experiencing dementia, I brought a different perspective. But I also had a really unique opportunity because Moscow, Idaho is like America, small town from the 1940s. And so if you are living with dementia, if you become a little forgetful or a little more than a little forgetful, if your rational thinking skills are beginning to fade, you can still live at home. And so I, I don't know anybody else who took five years away from their career and spent more of their waking hours with a variety of people who were experiencing dementia, who were also still living in their own homes, in their own community, and just receiving gradually increased support. And so what that did with my different background that allowed me to have a different perspective I got to see what dementia looks like before we tack on all the other problems of taking somebody who has always lived in their own home and moving them into a corporate group home setting or taking somebody who is losing their memory skills and losing their ability to learn new things through losing rational thinking skills and then uprooting them from their own homes where they're living where they have in, in a familiar environment. And we move them into a new situation where all of a sudden they need to be able to learn new things and grapple with change at the very time when they're losing their rational thinking skills. The two sets of skills you need the most when you get moved, when you have to deal with change. And so um, that to me is, is why I was able to spend five years just looking at people allowed to live their own lives in their own homes but dealing with this loss of skills, this gradual loss of, of cognitive skills. And that's why I could see the pattern. I could see unique opportunity. So Judy, as you started to describe that, I just thought that you're very learned, learned 
yes, use my correct English now that I know that you've got a background in English. Um, they were your teachers. They oh, were absolutely. You and oh, exposing you to a whole new way oh. of thinking and figuring things out. And what Entirely. a blessing you are to see them for who they are, not for what they're losing. For who they were. I could see who they were. And they are the, they're the one. I mean, I'm just the person. I really do feel that, you know, Dawn is, it's a vocation for me. It was like a job I was given them. And to me, it's giving them voice. I was gifted with the experience of being befriended by so many people who courageously, with so much courage, but also so much determination, tenacity, and intelligence, continued to figure out how to do their best day after day, even though they were losing some of the most crucial cognitive skills, the ones that we all rely on to get through the day every day. Uh, they were absolutely my teachers, but they're my heroes. Oh, yeah, they too. are. Yes. yes. Amazing. What an opportunity that you were willing to take on. And <laughs> aren't they fortunate that you chose to move to Moscow? Oh, what an amazing opportunity. And you were open to it. And they were open to receiving you as well and to teaching you. So very cool. Some of them not so open. Oh, <laughs> really? Some, the, the reluctance. Pretty, oh, yes. Yeah. People who are experiencing anosognosia, you know, they're unable to perceive right. that they're losing cognitive yeah. skills. And boy, they do not welcome new people showing up in their lives. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they're not able to accept that they are having losses and changes, right? So yeah, yeah they've lost the ability. Yeah. yeah. So Judy, would you care to just expand on what is Dawn? Yeah, so Dawn, it's an acronym for the Dementia and Alzheimer's Wellbeing Network, carefully chosen so that it would communicate hope and a beginning rather than that message of woe is me and you, there is nothing we can do and craziness is going to take over our lives. That is not what it must be. I wanted to communicate with Dawn that there is a way to work with dementia because dementia does not take away all of our skills. It takes away some very specific skills. And so the message of Dawn is to teach families, professional caregivers, people working in facilities or corporations or agencies to teach the pattern of skills kept and skills lost. And, you know, right away, whenever I speak in public, up will go two or three hands and they say, yes, but, yes, but you can't tell what will happen because there are so many different dimensions that everybody's experience is unique and individual. And my answer is, yes, that is true. Every human experience, whether it be regarding dementia or it's regarding childhood or whether it's regarding a specific traumatic experience, each of us has a unique and extremely personal experience. And may, I might add, entirely valid. Now with dementia, if you're looking at dementia from the perspective of disease, what type of dementia is my loved one experiencing? And now we're talking hundreds of possibilities, including combinations. You know, any number of diseases could cause dementia, not just Alzheimer's any number of life events, uh, a traumatic brain injury, a bad reaction to chemo, a bad reaction to anesthetic. All of these can also cause dementia to begin. It could also be caused by a lifestyle. We're now seeing research that tracks too much processed foods and particular processed meat is a link to dementia. Also, there's various combinations of drugs and specific drugs that raise the incidence of dementia. So right away, that's almost too much to even think about when you're trying as a family member to think about what their experiences are going to be as they move forward now that they have this diagnosis. Well, that's a lot to consider. And we're looking at it from a medical perspective. Now, the next thing you have to take into account, if that's your model, disease, now you have to start thinking about which parts of the brain are affected for your loved one with that particular type of dementia. Okay, now it's even more complicated. I, I'm getting confused. And if it's my loved one, I'm beginning to throw my hands up. I'm overwhelmed. But that's not all that will matter. You also have to take into account 
your loved one's personality. And that's not all. You also <laughs> must consider your loved one's life experiences. There's four factors affecting the path or the trajectory of a person who's experiencing dementia if you look at dementia from the perspective of disease. So that's not what I did <laughs> because I wasn't educated in medicine or even psychology or any of the related fields. And so to me, being a mere lawyer, <laughs> I, all I know from my law degree is there's going to be a pattern to the facts. And if the person comes into your office and they sit down in front of your desk and you're the lawyer and they come to you with a problem, they will start telling you what they think the problem is and they'll start telling you facts. And the lawyer's job is to continue to ask questions until they've got all the relevant facts. And once they've got relevant facts, facts are relevant because they fit into a pattern that meets a law. So what my training as a lawyer told me is if I'm trying to help somebody get through the day and I'm seeing emotions, emotional reactions, I'm seeing behaviors, I'm seeing them do things or not do things, and it doesn't make sense to me, it's because I don't have enough of the facts. And so I need to learn more. I need to back up, look at a bigger picture, and continue to look for relevant facts or a pattern. Now, as somebody who has really wanted to be a linguist and wanted to be a professor of language, not a lawyer, mm. <laughs> I also know the primary rule of language acquisition. And that is that when we human beings, when we learn a second language, the errors we make in speaking, reading, or listening to a second language, when we're trying to become fluent in a second language, our errors are determined by our previous language, our first language, and our errors are entirely logical. So once again, when I start spending time with people who are experiencing dementia, and I see them do something that doesn't make sense, deep down, I know that the human brain does not make illogical errors. It's programmed. And so whatever looked inexplicable or crazy to me at that moment really wasn't because I knew it was logical. And at that meant I just didn't have enough facts mm. to see the, the patterns. So do you see this changed it? And what technically what I was doing and what I speak a lot about right now is I was choosing to not look at dementia from a medical perspective. I was choosing to look at dementia from the experiential or functional perspective. I wasn't as a doctor saying, what's wrong with this person? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a behavior. The person's body isn't changing. They don't have tumors or broken bones or open sores. No, no, no. The only thing that's changing is the behavior. And so if, if I'm a doctor and I say, this person is diseased, the symptoms are behaviors, behavioral changes, then that means I am forced to look for treatments that will change behaviors. But a treatment that changes the behavior means psychotropic drugs, mood altering drugs, or just change the environment, lock the doors. So that's your medical framework of addressing dementia. And there is no way to avoid the focus on what's wrong with the person, new behaviors, and trying to change those behaviors when we don't have treatments, anything other than psychotropic drugs or mood altering drugs or locking doors. If that's our treatment, we're not addressing the real problem, what's really going on. And so you have to step back and say, is this really working? Is it possible to solve the problems presented by dementia by using a medical model? It isn't. It doesn't work. It's expensive in dollars and it's expensive in pain, emotional pain for the caregiver because it just gradually takes you apart day after relentless day as your loved one begins to experience more and more and more emotional pain themselves. So the medical model isn't fixing, it isn't solving, it isn't curing, it isn't treating, it's not successful. But if you step back and look at dementia from the experiential model, then it works. And that is what the Dawn Method is. Let's not believe that our loved ones 
are losing their minds when they experience dementia, because they're not. What they're losing is very specific. And five years of watching mm. with my heart, mm -hmm. but with my mind as well, trying to figure out what's going on here. If you think about people, they are losing one set of thinking skills. But we human beings have two complete sets of thinking skills. Our primary set gathers information through our senses, through our exposure to our environment, right? Everything you see, hear, taste, touch, smell, it's giving you information about what's going on around you. And you are receiving all of that information fully in the moment, in present time, without filter. Like you, you picture yourself, you walk into a room and there's a painting on the wall. As soon as your eyes hit that painting, as soon as you see it, you're like, oh, I love that. Or, oh, I don't yeah. like that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. instant. You put food in your mouth and it's like, oh, that's delicious. Or, mm, that's not. Uh, we have these instant reactions, no filter. It's just, that's beautiful to me. That's not beautiful to me. And then we have another set of thinking skills. So here's your second set of thinking skills. It's the one that Western society prizes and believes is the best. And it's not. It's actually just a set of tools. And it's secondary. But it's called your rational thinking skills. So here you are. You see the painting and you go, oh, I like that. And your companion says, why? <laughs> right? Okay, now your second set of thinking skills kicks in and you say, well, you know, because I really like the way the hills are kind of shaded and, and the way the artist made the distance look more blue. And then up, up close, it's that pretty color of green. I like the colors and I really like landscapes. And, you know, then the artist did a great job of those, those clouds. Or you've put the food in your mouth and you're like, oh, I don't like this. And your companion says, why not? I spent two hours cooking that. <laughs> and you say, well, darling, um, it just tastes a little salty to me. That's your rational thinking skills. You've got both sets. However, if you begin to experience dementia, you will eventually lose those rational thinking skills. And they are skills. They are tools. They are not the essence of you. You will not lose yourself. You will lose your ability to communicate because rational thinking skills includes language verbal language. You will not lose the ability to read nonverbal language. You will always be able to read my expression the moment I walk into your presence. You will always be able to tell, especially if you've been, if you're partners, if you've been together a long time, a momentary pause, the set of my shoulders, a gesture, posture, the tone of my voice, you will read it in a heartbeat. In fact, I think we get better at it as we lose our verbal language skills. So if we love somebody and they're experiencing dementia, it's critically important that we come to understand this pattern of skills kept and skills lost. So out of two sets of thinking skills, we lose the secondary set. However, part of the tools of that secondary set of rational thinking skills if your companion doesn't have those skills, you know, the rational thinking skills, they allow us to prioritize, to prioritize ideas and actions. And so if I can't prioritize one action as more important than another action, you're going to have a really hard time getting me to put down my coffee cup and go take a shower so you and I can get downtown for that doctor's appointment in one hour. And if I'm losing my ability to track the passage of time, and you tell me, one hour, honey, we've got one hour to be down there, I'm not going to understand what one hour means. And if, if it's cold outside and warm inside, and you say, honey, you can see the snow, it's snowing out there, you must put on your big heavy winter coat. But if I'm standing inside at 70 degrees, and I've lost that rational thinking tool that we all have from the moment of birth, which is being able to perceive cause and effect. 
I will utterly refuse to put on that big, heavy winter coat because where I'm standing right now, it's 70 degrees and I'm not yeah. cold. <laughs> yeah. 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 So we have to understand that what your loved one is doing and what they're not doing. Because if you don't understand that they're reading all of your nonverbal communication skills, you are constantly giving them messages about how you feel that you don't want to be giving them. So that's the number one takeaway is just be oh, yeah. aware that what you're conveying is being yeah. perceived. Because it's being perceived. Yeah. Nothing else but that is being read very loud and clear. clear. Yeah, exactly. Yes. No, and the no. other thing to keep in mind is if you walk into my presence and you look worried or you're frowning, you know, maybe your frown is just habitual and you've got no idea that when you are lost in thought, you wear a frown. Mm -hmm. If I don't have any rational thinking skills and if I don't have memory skills, I can't say to myself, well, an hour ago, she was on the phone with the bank trying to figure out why they bounced a check. And I can't say to myself, boy, you know, we've got so many things to worry about right now. No wonder my spouse looks concerned. You know? So yeah. we take it personally, but this is why strength-based care is critical. We need to understand what, what our loved ones are doing and will continue to do. And we need to understand what they can no longer and will become unable to do. And those two sets of thinking skills, that's just the first of three dyads, one kept, one lost. Well, losing the rational, the reasoning skills causes huge frustration for oh. the caregiver, Oh yes. especially if they're not really well-versed in what you're teaching. I think there's going to be lots of takeaways from today's podcast. Just knowing that you don't have to be frustrated if you realize that they can't process that anymore. You know, you think about how stressful it is and how, how often you are, you're frustrated and you're angry and you can't help but feel like they're attacking you or trying to, you know, trick you or pull the wool over your eyes. Doing it on giver, purpose. Yeah. Doing it on purpose. Yeah. You know, my mom never used to do that. She's yeah. become a mean person. If we understand the skills she can no longer use and how that affects her perception of reality and how that affects her perception of the messages you're communicating with your tone or your facial expression or your gestures, then we don't react feeling like that because our expectations have changed. You know, people always say, oh, Judy, you must be the most patient person on earth. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 I am not. Ask any of my friends, ask my husband. I am not patient. However, if I'm spending time with somebody who's experiencing dementia, I've got all my antenna out figuring out which skills this person still is able to use and which ones they're not using. And you're you know, directing your actions towards that. And I'm doing my best yeah. to not mislead them, frustrate them, or embarrass them. And if I know what they can and cannot do, then I don't embarrass them and frustrate them and we get along. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's and not it's that positive. I'm, it's a positive. It's a positive feeling. feeling. Yeah. Yeah, because imagine, imagine if you had lost all of your memory skills. I picture what it would feel like to be in the moment, anywhere, at, sitting at home in your armchair. What, what if you're sitting in your own living room in that chair that you've loved because you bought it, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago? You've had it upholstered twice. It's your chair and everything in your house. You used to be able to point around and say, you know where I got that knickknack? That was when your dad and I went to uh, Venice for the first time, you know, back in 1991. Um, you think about how we fill our houses with things that are familiar to us, that please us, that communicate beauty to us. Now imagine that you are sitting there, but you are living 100% in the present moment. Uh, Daniel Kahneman tells us that the psychological perception of now is three seconds. If you take away my memory skills entirely now, um, Alzheimer's is a classic disease that causes dementia where the memory skills typically go first and the recall of the nearest past goes first with Alzheimer's. People lose knowledge of the nearest past and ever deeper into the deeper past. And so their perception of when now is, is always drifting further into earlier in their lives. 
But there you sit. You cannot recall even what happened three seconds ago. If I can't recall what happened three seconds ago or any, any further or any deeper, how would I know that any of this is familiar? How would I even recognize that chair I'm sitting in? How would I recognize what's around me? So when I say, honey, I want to go home or let me out of here, I'm going home. What I'm saying really is I have lost all of my memory skills. I look at things and none of them look familiar to me. I am unable to access knowledge of the past. And so here I am in the present moment, every three seconds, completely without past knowledge. It's all new all the time. And that's why we say, I want to go home. And what we're saying is, oh my goodness, I wish I had that feeling of being at home where I am secure and safe mm -hmm. and surrounded by the familiar. Mm -hmm. So what, what should my loved one do for me? If you're the caregiver, you know, don't try to distract me. The need to feel safe and secure and at home is the essence of us. You know, our, our brains are screaming out to us four times every second from birth until death. Am I safe? The brain never stops. And it's your intuitive thinking skills gathering all of this information without filter. And then your rational thinking skills and your memory skills identifying that sensory stimulation, what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what you're tasting. That answers the question and says, yes, yes, brain, you're safe. It's okay. You're mm -hmm. safe. You're in a familiar place. You're at home. So when my loved one says, I want to go home, don't try to change the topic. Help them feel secure. They and say, come here. I need a hug too. Yeah. Oh, home. Home is the most wonderful thing in the world, isn't it? Which one's your favorite? You know what my favorite home was? You know, I remember when. And you start talking about how lovely home is. It might be a mutual home. It might be a childhood home. You eventually will know what version of home has made your loved one feel the safest. And then you and then hold on to that. You hold on to bring that. It up. And awesome. you become the source of the feeling of home. Right. You become the memory holder. So we have to work with what skills are lost and with what skills are, are retained. So, you know, like in terms, we lose one of our two thinking sets. And in essence, psychologically, we lose one of our two selves. We lose what Daniel Kahneman calls the remembering self, the part of us that is able to access knowledge of the past. And then we don't lose the experiential self. And that is our soul, the core of us, the essence of us, the us that lives 100% fully present in the present every moment. Now we lose the future too, because it takes rational thinking skills to anticipate the future, to plan for the future, to consider the future, to initiate activities, to choose to do something. That takes rational thinking. So really this person who's experiencing dementia they are living completely and fully experientially in the present. You know, and that's what we try to do with meditation, isn't it? Or, or being mindful. So that's so, why the hour wait to the appointment at the doctor oh, just means nothing. Nothing. Yep. That's right. Lots of three seconds in that hour. <laughs> <laughs> there is. And, and you know what it's like? I, I remember I'd be driving with my clients and I'd say to Mary, you know, oh, let's go for a scenic drive. Let's go get a hot chocolate. It's a beautiful snowy day out there. Oh, okay. Well, here's your coat. No, no, I don't want to. I'm, I'm not going. To, if you don't mind, I'm going to take your coat because you know me, I'm always cold. And we walk out the door and I'm carrying her coat. And then three seconds later, she says, oh, I'm cold. And I, need my coat. And I say, oh, here's your coat here. You can put your coat on. I'll help you. We'll get in the car. And about three seconds after we back out of the driveway, she's going to say, so Judy, what are we doing? Oh, you know, I thought we'd go for a drive. So why is it that we are upset by repetition? You know, I don't know, see, but it is annoying. It see, is we, so we annoying. are annoyed, aren't yeah. we? Now, how come? I spent most of a decade wondering yeah. why. Why are we upset by repetition? And it's cultural. We as a society, we prize memory skills. Mm -hmm. We don't prize experience we prize memory skills. 
So if you want to get a PhD, all you need is good memory skills and you will go from kindergarten to PhD and get gold stars all the way. Well, it's interesting that you say that because even when we're talking about the medical model, Mm -hmm. that's prized, but it's how can we fix this problem? It's all looking at what's wrong with the situation. Right. And it's how we're conditioned. It's how we're socialized. It's what we have been groomed to expect. Like this is medical and that's medical is the best way. Yeah. Right. But it is in the strengths-based approach. It's a great way to not focus on that. It's how we raise children. Oh, yes. But see, when we raise children, the infant arrives. It doesn't speak English, (laughs) right? It doesn't speak anything. And it does a lot of screaming and yelling, and it's got a lot of really inexplicable behaviors we don't understand, right? And yet, the parent doesn't go, eh, I've lost my baby. She doesn't even know my name. I can't talk to her. She doesn't understand what I'm saying. No, 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 we don't do that because we are habilitative and person-centered and we are strength-based and we don't consider childhood to be a disease. We do not look at our children and say, this one is broken. This one's not like a good adult. We recognize and accept childhood. So here's that child. And as an infant, we carry it around. Mm -hmm. We speak baby talk to it Mm -hmm. until it begins to learn language. We accommodate its emotional reactions, its emotional development. We accommodate the way it is maturing, changing. We accommodate its cognitive development, the skills. So that infant, or let's say the two-year-old, and actually we're talking two-year-old through mid-20s, has inconsistent and erratic rational thinking skills, particularly teenage years and early 20s. It's erratic. It's fully there one minute and it's absolutely gone the next. Your six-year-old has a certain set of emotional skills at a certain stage of development. And we've mapped all this out. So we have expectations. And when you've got a two-year-old, you provide an environment that keeps the child safe. There's locked doors. There's latches on cupboards. There's covers over outlets. Naps are part of a normal day. However, once that person is 12 years old, we don't lock the doors, we don't put covers over the outlets, and we don't require naps. Change the environment to accommodate the person's current situation. So, you know, this is very societal, where we accept childhood. We say, you know, it's, it's a time when people need to grow. We need to let them grow. We need to let them learn. We need to let them play. And then they'll become adults in due time. We expect adults to do a little less playing, be a little more responsible to do and accomplish and gather and take care of children. But our society has somehow forgotten about the elder. We don't even have a word for elderhood. It's not in the dictionary. We have childhood and adulthood, and we don't have elderhood. But elderhood is the third stage of life. And once we become elders, we stop doing and we start being. Once I am an elder, I pass the baton of doing to the adults. Mm -hmm. And I move into another role. Now my role is to be. It is to be rather than do. It is to think rather than accomplish. It is to start understanding and thinking and comprehending all of the wisdom I need to now share. And elderhood is a time of sharing. It's when we share our resources, we share our time, we share our wisdom, we share our thoughts, we pick up the slack. And societies that see the elder as having a different role than the adult, rather than like our society where we see elders as as broken and failing adults, those societies draw on the wisdom of, of a life lived. Yes, and they esteem them and they value them. Right. And then if you understand that dementia takes away just some of our skills, not all, if we understand what they can do and cannot do, and if we work with their skills rather than against them, they have so much to offer and so much to teach. And that's what happened for me. That's why my teachers were many, many people who were experiencing dementia. 
Oh, I just, again, love that they were your teachers and you were open mm. to the lessons that they were willing to teach you. And other people were resigning them to perhaps going to a home and that would have robbed them. Rob, it would. It does. Yeah. And it you're is. now teaching me. Elderhood is not in the dictionary. I didn't no. know that. Yeah, I went looking in Miriam Webster and I went looking online and it's supposed to be two words, elderhood. It doesn't refer to elderhood like a stage of life. It just refers to those two separate words with two completely different meanings. Wow. But isn't that sad? It is sad. It's very sad. But, you know, we really do think of ourselves as, as life being a trajectory. You start at birth and then it's ever better, happiness, success, accomplishment, better, 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 better. And then I die. Well, that's not what life is like. Life is a bell curve, you know, and we gain in strength and ability. And then we begin to lose strength and ability, both cognitively and physically. And some of us lose very little and others of us lose a lot soon. With dementia, there really is a pattern. And it's losing one of two sets of thinking skills. It's losing one of two selves, losing the remembering self, but keeping the experiential self. And then there's changes to our attention skills. And if you're looking at attention skills from the perspective of functioning, what you're talking about is the ability to be mindful, to choose where to direct your attention. So if I lose my ability to direct my attention, to redirect my attention, or to maintain my attention, then I cannot be mindful. However, the flip side of that, what I can do, and what is such a benefit to someone who is experiencing dementia, particularly, but we all use them all the time, is the two tools of mindlessness. We, you know, we hear all the time about mindfulness, but no mindlessness. There's two tools, muscle memory and automatic thinking scripts. We all use them every day, all day long. And if we didn't have those two tools, we'd be exhausted by breakfast time. If we had to think every time we wake up, your eyes open, you're laying in bed and you think, okay, which side of the bed am I on? It means I have to use the right side of my body to turn over, to put my feet on the ground. Okay, I have done this and I'm in a room and I need to think about where I keep my clothing. Okay, let's think this through, <laughs> right? You would have to think about every step of every task from the moment you opened your eyes. We don't do that. We do things on autopilot. We do, thankfully. Yeah, yeah. thankfully. And the, the reason we can do it is because primarily we have memory skills and we are in a familiar location. If it's the place I've woken up for the last 20 years, I don't even really have to wake up to make it to the bathroom in the middle of the night and back into bed. <laughs> but if I'm experiencing dementia and you move me to assisted living so I'm safer, yeah. I don't have that muscle memory any longer. And now every time I wake up, I got to think, where am I? How do I get out of this bed? I'm going to, oh, I'm on the right side. Okay, I'll put my feet on. Now I wonder which of these doors is a bathroom, right? Yeah. So, you know, taking people out of their familiar locations does yeah. not necessarily help. No. In fact, farms, that's another topic. Yeah, so. it's comforting to be in familiar territory. Yeah. Comforting. Yes. Yeah. And with dementia too, your example, the individual had to wake up to go to the washroom, yeah. knew that they still needed to, but then comes a time when dementia takes away knowing yeah. that you have yeah. to go to the bathroom. I think what happens is that we, because I've seen people forget what that feeling feels like, but I've had people forget what the feeling of hunger feels like. See, that's just past knowledge. The infant, when we're born, we don't know what that pain is, but it's mom that teaches us that, oh, you're hungry. Here's a warm bottle of milk. Okay, now that pain goes away. And sooner or later, we start associating that. We learn that when I feel this pain in my tummy, that means I need to eat something. But dementia takes away memory. And so we don't know what the feeling feels like. I had one client and she forgot what hunger felt like. And she kept telling us she had a broken rib. So we had to go talk to the doctor and say, all right, we're bringing her in. She'd gotten what the feeling of hunger means. So you'll have to diagnose her broken rib because we're not going to be able to tell her it isn't one and tell her the cure to heal that broken rib <laughs> is every time you feel it, go to your refrigerator and get one of those little tubs of yogurt. And I want you to eat the whole thing that will help that rib heal. 
And that was what we had to do because she'd lost knowledge of the past. She no longer recognized. And without rational thinking, she jumped on this interpretation of the present that made sense to her limited comprehension. And we wouldn't be able to change that. You looked at the bigger picture, you got the facts, you figured out what was going on, and you were creative. Yeah, in going to the physician and working with the physician, like we need to get her to eat. (laughs) Yes, yes, yeah, that's right. But I was using my rational thinking skills. I still have them. (laughs) I was using my memory skills because I still have them. Yeah, I was using my intuitive thinking skills because we both had them. And I was thinking about how it felt to be totally experiential in the present. And I was questioning whether she had enough attention skills to actually carry through and whether she had enough rational thinking to be able to follow that sequence. And the time came when she couldn't carry through and she couldn't initiate and she couldn't follow the sequence. That's when we had to up care so that somebody was feeding her small amounts on a regular basis. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Like, how long was she aware of the instructions to go and get the yogurt and... For her, I think that was probably another six months. Oh, wow. Yeah. But you know, with dementia, it could be another six days. It could be another six hours. That's okay because we have all of our skills. We as caregivers, and this is working with dementia. This is the opposite of saying, I don't know anything about it. It's a disease. I'm not a doctor. I can't do a thing. She behaves in this strange new ways and she's always upset and mad. And give me a drug. (laughs) That might be the short way to try to solve problems, but it creates another whole batch. And so really the way, if you truly want to lessen your stress and your guilt and your emotional pain, your anger, your frustration, your exhaustion, if that's what you want to do, you really do have to learn what the strengths of dementia are. Which skills will my loved one keep? Which ones are they going to continue using? Which ones are going to be gone or are gone? And then you begin working with that. And as you begin doing that, your own emotional load will lighten. There's no easy path. How long does it take for a caregiver to learn this approach to automatically respond that way? Eight weeks. Eight so weeks. this this is why I teach the Don method in eight classes, and I will not teach it any quicker than over a period of eight weeks. Okay. All and, right, everyone listen up. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. We, and probably you figured that out scientifically. No, I figured it out. Repeated failure, you know, because people say, <laughs> oh, you know, I don't have time. Just give it to me in a nutshell. Yeah. It's like, yeah, okay, well, humans are, are complex. Yeah. We are complicated beings. That's Very really complex. Cool, though. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I asked that question. Because if someone is listening, who would like to take the training and realize that they could learn to use and apply this approach that they need to take some time and invest, invest in learning. Yeah. Yeah. It's not the quickest route. But it's worth it. But it is actually, I think it's the only way. It's the only route. If you want to spend time together in companionship and peace without constant conflict and pain, you have to learn what's going on and support your loved one in what they can and can't do. That's all you can do. It's the only way. Make it positive and have some good memories. Yeah. More good memories. Yeah. You become the storyteller. You become Mm -hmm. the memory keeper. I think this is all just things I teach with the Dawn Method. You know, if you're experiencing dementia, if you're losing those skills that you've used your whole life, you know, and you've just always been capable and busy and do stuff and not even think about it, You imagine trying to live life with one set of thinking skills with no memory. Oh, does it ever take courage and tenacity and and brilliance? Absolute brilliance. There's no loss of intelligence. There's loss of ability, not intelligence. We don't lose ourselves. We lose a way that we communicate. So, you know, it always breaks my heart when I hear somebody say, I lost my loved one to dementia. Mm. They don't even know my name anymore. (laughs) You know, yes, grieve. It is sad. You should grieve. And you should not grieve in front of your loved one. And when you're with your loved one, remember what you have. You know their name. You haven't lost your memory skills. You haven't lost your rational thinking skills or your attention skills. Sit down beside your loved one and say, 
hi, mom, it's Judy. You know who I am? I'm your, I'm your second oldest daughter. Mm -hmm. And you and me, we love each other so much. Let me tell you one of my favorite memories from childhood. <laughs> oh, and I remember when you and I did this. And I remember when you and I did that. And I remember you telling me about how you met dad. And I remember you telling me your favorite memory from high school. You know what that was, mom? Oh, it was when, and you just sit there and you tell your, your loved one, you tell them who they are and who you are. And then you start telling them all of those favorite stories of theirs that they told you over and over and over again, that you were so irritated to keep hearing. <laughs> and you tell those memories in their words, using their phrases. You tell them that they have lived a good life a life worth living. If you do that, you have not lost your loved one to dementia and they have not lost you. Yeah, I teach that in the last two classes of the Dawn Method. We got uh, a glimpse at the finale <laughs> of the course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. So Judy, your website, your books, your experience as a TED Talker, like you've got so much that is out there. And folks can reach you by? You know, actually, if you just go on Google and put in Judy and dementia, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> it's all over. But the website is thedawnmethod.com. Yes. And everything's on the website. And you do have the newsletter. You do have yeah. some free resources as well. There's a lot. Seeing yeah. the value, hearing the value today about the eight week course, I think would be a really good investment to improve your approach, to improve your, your relationship and your experience looking after someone who's got dementia. Right. Yeah. yeah. Lessen the pain and expense for both of you. Yeah. Do you have anything you want to add before we sign off? You know, I guess I'd say one thing, because like on your questionnaire, you said, is there a, a fun fact? Yeah. A fun fact about Judy. Okay. <laughs> Here's the most important thing for us as human beings to remember and to learn, especially if you're spending time with somebody who's experiencing dementia. The secret to life, all beauty and companionship and comfort is all available only in the three second now. It's not in the past. It's not in the future. The only place you get it is right in front of your own nose. Most people probably don't know that we have just had the most severe drought in Northern Idaho and, and extending into Montana and Eastern Washington ever on record. The woods here are tinder dry. Instead of two or three feet of snow, we had less than seven inches all winter. Yesterday, I was outside in the garden. I was hand watering each of our new baby raspberry bushes. When all of a sudden, a pine siskin came and sat on the fencing right in front of me. What is that? It's a little bird that's probably about two and a half inches long. It's soft yellow and gray Ooh, colors. Beautiful. You could you could Google it and you'll get pictures. They're pretty little things. This little pine siskin popped up and sat on the fence right in front of my eyes, maybe a foot from my eyes. And it turned its little head and it looked at me and it chirped. And then it got down right next to my hand and it was within a centimeter of my hand and it looked at me and it chirped. That little bird was thirsty. Yeah. I put my sprayer down so it made a little bit of a puddle in the pine chips. And that little bird began to drink and along came two friends. And so for about a minute yesterday afternoon, three little pine siskins let me give them water. They drank and they bathed right next to my fingers. That is where beauty exists, is in the present. So if you are experiencing dementia, that's where they are forced to live. Bring beauty and love and companionship into your presence, into the now, because that's where respite is. Yeah, so thank you for that. I really appreciate all of this. I'll put yeah. the links in the descriptions and... Oh, I've sure enjoyed chatting with you. I always hope some listener will find some nugget that just speaks to them and helps. So that's always my goal. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Judy. This has been great. There were so many nuggets in today's episode. Having a strength-based, person-centered approach to providing dementia care may take practice, but the benefits for both you and your care recipient are so rewarding. 
To hear what it means when your loved one says they want to go home certainly helps us better understand how to respond. Also, drawing up beside our loved one and telling their own stories back to them will create a pleasant time together. And let's not forget that as they lose their rational thinking skills, they are still able to pick up on nonverbal cues, our nonverbal cues. If you would like to learn more about the Dawn Method and the strength-based, person-centered approach to dementia care, please check out Judy's website at thedawnmethod.com. If you find yourself in the midst of your own caregiving journey and need some supports or encouragement, tap into Alongside Caregiver Consulting at www.alongsidecaregiverconsulting.ca or at Alongside Caregiver Consulting's Facebook page or Instagram account. Island Treasures now has its own Facebook group called Island Treasures for Caregivers, where you can drop in and add a comment or join a discussion and let me know what you found helpful in today's episode. If you'd like to share your story as a guest on the Island Treasures podcast, please contact me by email, either through my website or at alongsidecaregiverconsulting at shaw.ca. And thank you for tuning in today and to Judy Cornish for sharing her wisdom and insights. If you don't want to miss future episodes, be sure to subscribe to Island Treasures podcasts. And while you're at it, feel free to leave a rating and a review. See you next episode. Thank you.